Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Karen Doyle and I'm Operations Director of CTAM Europe. I hope you're all well and fighting fit. If you aren't already a member of CTAM Europe and are joining us for the first time, welcome. And we'll be setting you up with free temporary membership of CTAM Europe until the 1st of June. So you can enjoy all the future we weekly webinars we have planned. And you can also look back on past webinars and podcasts there on the members only website, uh, sorry, members only area of ctameurope.com. This is a stage now where we normally show the executive management program video, but as many of you have been on the weekly webinars recently, I'm going to share this by email with the new members. But to give you an update uh, on the dates, we've postponed the program now from June until the 8th to the 13th of November. So you have plenty of time still to register. So let me introduce you to today's presenter. We have today Guy Bisson, Research Director at Ampere Analysis. Guy will be sharing his 10 drama trends to watch. He'll answer questions along the way, so please use your Q&A button and test his knowledge. So sit back and enjoy, and I'll now hand you over to Guy. Thank you, Karen, and good afternoon, everybody. As you've just heard, my name is Guy Bisson. I'm Exec Director of Ampere Analysis. Um, for those who are not familiar with uh, what we do, we are London-based entertainment industry analysts specialised in the TV business, and we work with a number of international media groups from the US studios to the telecoms groups to the pay TV operators and the rights holders, providing data on consumer insight, content strategies, and operator KPIs, forecasting and performance. What I'm going to run through for you today is some of the drama trends that we've been picking up. Um, this presentation was put together before the lockdown with the COVID-19 crisis, so I'll be happy to take any questions on potential implications of that. But hopefully once the current production hiatus is over, and we're hoping that that will be over by Q3 this year, um, these trends will kick straight back in. So let's run through what we've been picking up out there in terms of the content market. 10 trends to watch. But before we go into the 10, let's just remind ourselves of where we are in terms of the market. So the key development, of course, is that for the first time in 100 years of history, the US studio groups are going direct to the end consumer. Prior to this point, of course, there's always been a middleman and a relationship whereby those who are producing the content don't necessarily take it to the end viewer, although, of course, with vertical integration, they do through some of their properties. For the first time then we have the studios going direct and we have a number of new entrants, often from a technology background like Apple, Amazon and others. What I think we've seen in the market is two cycles and those cycles are self-perpetuating. Let's start with the vicious cycle and that is kicked off by the streamers, so Netflix originally, but many more since, who have boosted their original production output in a response to one very important need, and that need is the need for global rights. As they competed in local markets, that strategy gave them edge, and local players and incumbents moved into the same area, making their own originals. Um, and as they started to go direct to then protect their margins, licensing became a problem for others or will become a problem. And that means more original production is needed and hence the cycle continues. But that same cycle can also kick off a virtuous cycle and that is back to that point too, the competitive edge of original production, the response of local incumbents, the pressure on the entire ecosystem leading to budget growth, 
and local production becoming competitively advantageous, but also more cost effective than using some of the larger markets as your production base. That is a positive for the international production and distribution business. The other thing that we're seeing in the market is that content has again, I guess again, risen to the fore. So throughout the 25 years that I've been following this industry, the phrase content is king, has uh, slipped in and out of popularity, while certainly the content offer is now central to the competitive positioning of everyone within the market. And that content offer is impacted by a number of factors. And we'll run through most of these as we go through the 10 trends. So first of all, we have regulatory intervention, increased direct competition that we've talked about from the studios and others. That leads to viewer fragmentation and an increasingly crowded market. We also have an evolving demographic base in terms of who is watching streaming, and we'll talk about that as well. The studio licensing challenge kicked off by their own direct strategies and the potential um, that that blocks access to their content for others. Globalization, which really is quite a new phenomenon in terms of having truly global platforms. The industry hitherto was very regional in terms of the way the business models worked. And the subsequent knock-on effect of internationalization. So into the 10 trends to watch. Well, number one is a regulatory factor, and that is quotas. So you'll all be aware, I'm sure, that the European Commission is looking to 30% European content quotas for streamers in Europe, and that applies to the local players, but also to the internationals like Netflix. What does that mean? Well, depending on the market, Netflix, Amazon need uh, one to several thousand hours of content to boost their catalogs up to a 30% European quota. But the interesting thing is if you look across Europe and the catalogs as a whole, 26% of titles are already European. So where's that apparent mismatch between the local percent and the European percent? It is, of course, caused by the fact that not all content is licensed pan-regionally. So Netflix could potentially fix that quota problem simply by extending their licensing agreements. I say simply, but of course, it's never quite that simple. Um, and we've just got a question come in, so I'll pause briefly to answer that. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. The question is, with the lack of production and shoots going on due to the COVID-19 pandemic, is there sufficient cap capacity within rights holders to provide an uninterrupted pipeline? So our current thinking on that is that around Q3, Q4, there will be issues around uh, new content flowing into the system. That's twofold. It will uh, impact notably on high-end uh, scripted drama in particular, because that has come to a complete halt. But it will also impact seasonal shows that would normally have been filmed over the summer and shown in autumn, winter. So to give a UK example, I suspect shows like Antiques Roadshow are, uh, are one of the types that is, is at risk. Um, what that means, of course, is that archive and already finished content potentially rises in importance. And we've already seen a number of players look to boost acquisition strategies to make up for that impending shortfall. So I think there are two factors. I, I, I think that is happening. The shortfall is being made up. But there will still be um, a bit of a, a, a problem come the autumn winter where there's a, a lack of new content before the production fully ramps back up again. Um, another question, uh, thanks Jeremy. Large part of European content is from UK studios, so will this count as European in the future? Um, and the answer to that is yes. 
So the quota applies to Europe, not European Union. Um, and of course the UK is still part of Europe. So that will count towards the quota. Um, so with those two questions answered, hopefully, I'll move on to the next slide. Just to recap on this one, um, extending licensing agreements rather than buying more content potentially gets Netflix up to 26% European. Trend number two then is the rise of the new commissioners. If we look at the top 15 largest commissioners of new scripted content, there are a number of important points on this chart. One is the sheer size of Netflix compared to everybody else. So two and a half times the major uh, local broadcasters like the BBC and the US network groups. Five times the size of smaller European broadcasters, large pay TV channels and regional SVODs, and seven times the size of some of the new entrants and second tier premium channels. So Netflix is now a major force within the market, and you can see the scale of that here. Social platforms, too, are commissioning at least some drama. Now, if we look at uh, Quibi, the short form platform from Katzenberg, and then the social players, you can see very clearly that most of their commissioning is unscripted, but they are making some scripted content as well. So they are a new force within the global content and commissioning mix. Trend number three is content spend. Over the last five years, global spend on content, and this excludes sports, which would make these bars even bigger, has grown 36%. That is a third more than it grew in the previous five years. And that is definition of the boom that we find ourselves in at the moment. Next five years, we forecast similar levels of growth, 25%. Now, impacted a bit by the current crisis and the uh, inevitable economic downturn, but we've just put out some analysis this morning that shows that actually content spend is not as negatively impacted as other sectors, like for example, the advertising market. So it doesn't fully follow the trend of an economic downturn. And another question just come in, <coughs> excuse me, how will new players such as Disney, Amazon, impact Netflix's current position? So the answer to that is twofold, especially in the case of the studio groups. One is they're pulling back content, their own content for their own services, which obviously changes the catalog and offer of Netflix and therefore its competitive positioning. And the second is viewer fragmentation and extra competition for Netflix, which of course makes it harder for Netflix and some of the early players to grow their customer base. At the same time, meaning that they can't significantly reduce content spend because the competitive position has got harsher. Trend number four is holdback and internal demand. So this is coming on to that licensing challenge. Um, what we can see is that the top drama producers, so the previous graph we were looking at commissioners this is producers so the largest producer in the world disney but what you can see from the bubbles is that now only 10 percent of their production is for parties or entities which disney does not own so 90 percent of their production is going into their own channels that, and their, of course their own svod service now or their own direct service other major studios, similarly high levels of internal production, meaning that large independents like Endemol, now Endemol Banerjee, who produce almost all of their content for third parties, rise in importance. But also pointing to that licensing challenge that I mentioned as these major producers increasingly hold back their own content from third parties, but also from their own distribution businesses. 
trend number five, partly as a response to that, but not entirely, is the new studios. So if the majors who for the last hundred years have dominated the global production business begin to explore direct strategies, what is filling the gap? Well, a number of players have changed tack in order to seize that opportunity, but also to um, improve their own market position. The first group are pay TV operators, telecoms groups, and new slate finance studios. So those are things like venture capital groups getting into the production business, financing whole slates of production to create mini studios. Blumhouse, which is a, a US horror producer, and they've just done Invisible Man, for example, is one example of that. But I'd also put pay TV operators like Nordic Entertainment, um, Orange Studio Canal, and even Netflix into that new studio category. So this come from the platform and pay TV business. The other category that is increasingly behaving like a studio business are large broadcasters. So what I'm calling service companies, large broadcasters, large um, pubcasters like the BBC, ITV, Actress in Spain, and major content distributors like Beta Film in Germany, Fremantle in the UK, and even talent agents like um, Endeavour, who are now WME Endeavour, heavily moved into the production, finance, and distribution business, so acting more and more like studios. And as those studios go direct, there will be even more demand for anyone who can fill that gap. So this is looking at the exposure of Netflix to that major player licensing challenge. Just taking the studios who we know have announced or even launched firm plans to go direct, we can see that 20% of Netflix's current catalog is at risk of pullback by those studios. So a very significant proportion of the Netflix offer potentially at risk of being held back. And that will change the competitive dynamics of the market, back to that question that was just asked a few minutes ago. Trend number six is globalization. And globalization as it applies to content. Again, the US studio groups always produced some content internationally, always co-produced internationally, but the majority came from the US. We're now in a situation where a major US-based entity produces the majority of its content outside the US market. So this is showing Netflix's upcoming originals, not what they've got on platform at the moment, but what they've got in the works. And you can see that 51% is being made across a diverse array of international non-US markets. Piece of analysis we've done, which isn't shown in these slides, but we can see quite clearly where they're underweight in terms of regional production. And just to highlight a couple of markets, Germany, Australia are notably underweight for where they should be in terms of Netflix local production. Central and Eastern Europe also um, and countries like Turkey and other and some other Eastern markets, particularly Russian speaking. So going forward, we'd expect to see more original local production in those regions and markets. But content globalization leads to internationalization and that of course impacts the language in which drama is produced. And there is a holy trinity of production languages now emerging. English, of course, remains by far the largest. But the second now is Mandarin, um, driven by the size, the internal size of the Chinese market, not so much by uh, international sale and export of that content. And the third language is Spanish, uh, Europe's number two language. But other key languages beginning to emerge like Hindi and Turkish. 
Trend number seven is the changing business of distribution. Because of the changes that we're seeing, because of that studio licensing challenge, because studios and others are holding back content that would previously have gone into international distribution, the distribution business needs to change. So while this was their traditional stomping ground, buying uh, the rights to content and selling it to people who took it to the end users, channels, pay TV platforms, VOD services, increasingly distributors who are positioning for the future are moving backwards in the value chain and becoming producers and financiers themselves. And that of course is in order to secure the rights they need to continue operating that distribution business. Trend number eight is the necessary evil of co-production. And I say evil only because um, everyone who gets involved in co-production, the first thing they say is how difficult and challenging it is, particularly as the number of partners ramps up. Um, and an increasing number of partners is one of the factors of that vicious cycle that I had on one of those first slides that is leading to an increase in production budget, increase in risk, and a need to increasingly spread that risk through multiple co-production partners. But if we drill down into the largest co-producers globally, and again, this is looking at shows that are currently in production or development. So this is from our commissioning database. You can see two broad groups of co-producer. Large public service broadcasters, ZDF, BBC, France Television, RAI, etc., and global and large regional SVOD services. They are the two major groupings who are driving the co-production market today. And the reason, of course, is fairly obvious. And it comes back to the rights situation. Large local pubcasters are happy putting in some of the budget in return for single market rights. Large SVOD players need rest of world. So it works rather well for those two groupings to get involved in co-production and spread the risk, particularly for higher end drama. So co-production an ongoing and key trend. If we drill down into what we can see is getting co-produced, so looking at the type of content, you can see one standout genre, and that is crime and suspense. And I think that's primarily because it's universal in theme and thus works across borders, whereas some other genres and topics work less well across borders. The other two groupings you can see, considerably smaller but still important, sci-fi and historical, and I think that's driven by budget. So those two genres in particular are very, very expensive to make, and thus co-production increasingly makes sense for them. Historical themes as well can be more universal and travel better than some other genres. Trend number nine is the evolving audience. So if we think about SVOD, you probably have a view in your head of what the typical Netflix customer looks like. And that view, if you look at the pie chart on the left, is probably correct, because you probably say they skew younger, and indeed they do. 41% of streaming customers in Europe and this is all streaming platforms, not just SVOD, are under 35. And that compares to 33% across the wider population. So considerably more likely to be under 35. But if we look at the growth market for streaming, where the new customers have been coming from, graph on the right, you can see very clearly that the biggest growth in customers is coming from people aged 45 to 54, and the second biggest from age group 55 to 64. And that, of course, impacts 
the type of content that streaming players want to commission, the type of content they want to acquire, because the genre interest of those two demographics is very different. So we're seeing increasing amounts of crime, crime procedural, and period drama going into and being commissioned and made by streaming platforms. Trend number 10 then is the year of AVOD. So 2020 will be the year of AVOD and it will lead to another change in the platform mix. Nominally, the AVOD market is already very crowded. The social networks, of course, publishers, device aggregators like Roku and new entrant pure play AVODs like Pluto, Tubi and Crackle. But the new 2020 entrants will be adopting primarily the hybrid business model. So we've seen this already from Huli, from CBS, but Peacock in particular, a very interesting disruptor into the AVOD market because of what they will do around advertising load within the programming. So capping ad load at five minutes per hour maximum, even for the free service, is gonna be hugely disruptive to the US network television model. So a new wave of disruption set to run through the market in 2020. And in terms of content and AVOD, let me explain that in three slides, uh, three charts rather, one slide, three charts. Drilling down into AVOD today, you can see the first chart on the left, usage is very, very low. So four to 6% of US broadband homes currently accessing the major US AVOD platforms. So low viewing. Content-wise, up to 90% of the content on those platforms is more than five years old. In some cases, 80 plus percent is more than 10 years old. So the content offer at the moment is skewing to archive and catalog very, very heavily. But if we think about how Netflix evolved, just five years ago, 50% of its catalog was over five years old. And today that has dropped to just one third. So we'd expect to see a similar evolution among the AVOD players as their revenue story begins to evolve. That of course will lead to acquisition of newer and newer content and ultimately entry into original production just as the SVOD players have done already. So that was the 10 trends. Let me leave you with one more slide. And that is drilling down into the zeitgeist for drama commissioning. So what I've done here is drill down into our commissioning database, again, looking at upcoming productions and stuff that's being made, not on air, and picked out four clusters of theme. What is hot in drama commissioning at the moment? Well, these are four of many other themes. Number one, the Me Too movement, themes around female empowerment. A few examples here. Number two, horror and mystery, and that's because it plays particularly well to a younger audience and a younger SVOD audience in particular. Number three, and I suspect with the lockdown that we're all under at the moment this will become an even bigger theme but even before lockdown this was a key theme driven by uh, the impact that social media in particular is having on younger people's minds mental health so a number of commissions across both scripted actually actually and unscripted are heavily focused on themes around mental health and the final theme that i picked out in drama is business, and this one's a bit of an odd one, partly driven by China, where uh, themes around business are particularly popular. And But also we've got some non-Chinese examples like the Australian ABC surfing business empire drama Barons that is currently in, in the works. 
And with that, I'll say thank you very much. There is just one question, one more question come in. Um, <laughs> well, was I surprised that um, Quibi's day one downloads appeared very low in contrast to a service like Disney Plus? Uh, frankly, no, I wasn't surprised. I think we're all probably aware that the business of uh, short form, particularly high end short form, has proven challenging. Um, whereas comparing it to Disney Plus, which is a much more established business model brand, uh, franchise owner, and content owner, um, you know, is, is a very different proposition. So I think, you know, as I, I've said many times in the past, I wouldn't bet against Katzenberg. But I think it does remain a very challenging market to try to penetrate into, um, particularly at this time in the market where we are entering a phase of very, very crowded um, choice for consumers in the streaming space. So if there are any more questions, please type away. Um, I'm more than happy to discuss anything you'd like. Uh, off at a tangent or something that may have been inspired by the slides I've just presented, feel free to ask. And there don't seem to be any more questions, so I'll hand back to Karen. Thank you. Guy, thank you. That was a super presentation. Very informative as ever. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for everybody for their questions as well. If you do have any more, either jump in now or you can email info at ctameurope.com or guys, details are there on the screen as well. If you wish to view the presentation again, this will be uploaded onto the members only section of the CTAM Europe website alongside the past webinars and podcasts from CTAM Europe and also from CTAM US. Um, so you can check those out on there. We'll keep you updated about the next series of webinars. Next week, we have got Jonathan Broughton from Media Business Insight. Um, so thank you very much again, Guy. Thank you, everybody, for joining. And we wish you a great week and keep safe and keep inside. Thank you. Thanks, Guy. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.